Here. Ran about 2,000 instructions per second, so we're really starting to motor quite mm -hmm. nicely. Uh, excuse me, Matt, I'll point the other side to you. Still a tape input. Mm -hmm. So again, I lament that the knowledge we had during Colossus has got lost after there. Uh, output will be on a teletype here. Uh, no keyboard to speak of. What you would do is load the program, start, set the start address, and it will start to work from there. So really, still very basic, basic in that mm -hmm. sense, uh, from there. It had core memory. All right, the question again. Matt, would you care to try and lift up this? Or so, would you like to give us a sense of how heavy that, that memory is? Significant. Yes. This is a core memory. So, what you've got is a ferrite cores, as the name suggests, with wires running through it. So, what you would do is, if you're going to write to that piece of memory, you'd write on this piece of wire, this piece of wire, and set the state of this magnetic to, you know, uh, set the status one or a zero. You then read it using the double wired afterwards. Now the wonderful thing is when you've read it you destroy the memory. So you're going to write it again. And this memory stuff's not easy at all. So it really is not a trivial exercise writing where you're getting these. A colleague of mine worked out and said if you filled this room and I take it from there to there to there, you'd end up with about four gig of memory. <laughs> The one thing he didn't calculate is the amount of electronics you need on the other side of it and how slow it would be. Remarkably slow. This is an example of a control board. If I can use this example. And you'll notice the handy dandy <laughs> USB sockets on it. Mm -hmm. what's, this is probably the better example to show you. What's interesting, this is a single sided board. So you've got a copper conductor on one side, you've got components on the other side. I can recognise these are transistors, yeah. Mullard OC23s, which is high power Mullard ones. This is probably the read write amplifier that you would have used for some memory across here. This is probably some arithmetic logic, and I can again recognise probably some geranium transistors. So they would not have been very fast nor very stable. They would have had a lot of problems in, in the heat as well. So it gives an example of the board. Typically, your computer at home would have a thinner board than this. And anything up to, I'm going to guess, 12 to 14 layers within it. Maybe even more to do So it gives you an idea of what you're looking at here. they also exploring loads of ideas. So they used uh, film, 35 millimeter film. They were near the Kodak factory, so they nicked across Kodak and said, Make, take some of your film, put a magnetic coating on it. There's an example here. And I write that magnetic coating. You may if you look closely you can see, you know, sort of get a sense of ones and noughts here. This is a stunning one meg. <laughs> so one meg. Absolutely amazing. Um, this machine itself was run by a very enterprising lady, Diane St. Johnson. She bought it for about £29,000 in about 1960-ish. Which, you, if you correct for inflation, would have probably been something like 500, 550k. She then ran a bureau so people would come up with their accounts, sales figures, or otherwise, and they wanted some calculation done on it. She'd rent out the machine at around 60 to 80 pound an hour. So, a nice little business and an emerging business. Really, probably the best example we've got of someone being quite innovative. Um, but also getting into, here's computers available. The other thing that I never really got to tell a colleague of mine talk about it is, you'd get one printout back to you, and your company would have to work on that one printout. So it had to be shared with the account department, the sales department, the whole lot. You know, not like now, you get loads of printouts, you just get the one printout for your 60 to 80 pounds.